Well, good morning. I am a Jamie, but I'm not the Jamie. Um, but I'm Pastor Jamie. Um, grateful to be one of the pastors here at the Church of Martinsburg. And often I'm not preaching, but I got the opportunity to do so this morning with AJ being out. And uh, today is Fifth Sunday uh, as a church. We do family worship Sunday. We we there was one. <laughs> let's let's try it again. Today is Fifth Sunday, family worship Sunday. All right. So this gives us an opportunity as a church to, for all of the family to gather together, to be here. Kids are here with us, and it's a, it's a great opportunity for us. And we do this every fifth Sunday. We don't have classes back there. But we want them here with us. Um, so kids, can I get y'all's attention? I want to hear you, not the parents, not the adults right now. I want to hear you guys say good morning. Can we try that? One, two, three. Lots of voices. Strong on this side. You guys, I'm just not feeling it. Cool. All right, maybe we'll get there. Um, so kids, today in your sermon notes, the word of the day is gather or gathered or gathering. Just hit all three of them. So it's words of the day today, but I want you guys listening for that. And so for the kids that like counting or tallying up how many times I say that, uh, if you would go back to the kids resource table uh, in the back after the sermon, there's a little basket back there and a white piece of paper next to it. You can write down your name and how many times I said these three words. And uh, I've got a book for you that I'll give out later this week. Little Pilgrim's Progress. So kids, you have to be listening this morning in order to get this. So go back to that after the sermon. Um, so if you don't have one of the kids' sermon notes and you want to do that, maybe now's a good time to go ahead and grab that. Justin, not you, for your kids only. Um, real quick survey, though. Dads, can I get a raise of hands if you got the kids ready this morning? Okay, a few. All right, brace yourselves. Now, moms, who got the kids ready this morning? Quite a few more hands are going up. So I, I want to address something, right? that often plagues our society and in our church in many cases. Dads are called to lead the families, and this takes many forms oftentimes. But, but guys, why is it a regular occurrence that we leave it up to the, the moms to get the kids ready, to get them out the door for church, to get them to class, or even help them to sit and behave in, in a, a worship service? Let's just be honest. Like, we got to step this up. Uh, I've failed myself in many cases, and uh, it's not served my wife Rachel well, but... Taking little steps, maybe like having the kids set on one side and, and your wife on the other, just to uh, allow her some time to listen to the sermon, and you could help to correct and help the kids to listen. Uh, it could be cr a great benefit to her. So let's, let's just face it, a lot of times, uh, kids, they just respond better to, to dads uh, for correction uh, than they do moms. And so if, if you need to switch seats right now, no judgment zone, now's a good time to do it. So uh, I won't call anybody out if you decide to do that. But um, as we've been planning for Sunday school uh, over these last couple months, the elders and I have had a, a few questions about kids coming into the, the service, and they've been really good conversations, honestly. And so what better way for us this morning as a church to think about this question and answer the crucial question uh, that I'd like to answer this morning. Why should children gather with us? It's a legit question. I mean, I, I don't want to just try to answer this from my own personal thoughts. I think we need to go to the scriptures and, and look at them and also just look at the historical context of the church. Um, you might be sitting here thinking, well, uh, the kids are here now, so what's the point of us even talking about it? But Maybe you're here and you're excited as I am for the kids to be in the corporate worship setting. Anybody else? All right. Was that kids or was that adults? Uh, well, either or. We're excited. Or maybe you're thinking, I don't even have any kids or I, now I'm an empty nester and how much does this have to do with me? Well, honestly, it has a lot to do with you, so don't get too cozy in that seat and nod off. So raise your hand <clears throat> if here... As an adult, you sat in church as a little kid, whether it's with your parent or grandparent. Okay, there's a lot of hands. Look up around the room. Keep your hands raised real high. All right, you can put them down. 
Kids, raise your hand if you've ever had a time where mom or dad or somebody else corrected you or, or asked you to sit quietly or sit up during a sermon. Yeah. Yeah, quite a few. Quite a few. Okay, all right. Well, when I was younger and I was in church, um, I would always sit uh, in the corporate worship gathering. We had Sunday school uh, earlier um, than the corporate worship gathering, and Sometimes I sat with my, my parents, and sometimes they let me sit in, in a different row up ahead of them or beside or something like that. Um, but sometimes I would just, like, I would do things that it, I knew and my parents knew and the people around me knew I shouldn't do, and I'm talking, I'm moving around, and I'm doing different stuff, and, and I always hear this. <clears throat> and when I heard it, this is my mom, when I heard it, it's like the hair on the back of my neck raised up, and I knew oh my gosh, she sees me. And so it's good to be corrected. Uh, but that sticks with you. A couple years ago, mom and I were sitting here in the service. She was like two seats down and she, she just had a, like allergies or something. She cleared her throat. She went, <clears throat> and I, it was like that. Oh my God. Like I'm, I'm here and I'm, I wasn't doing anything wrong. And I looked at her and so she wasn't looking at me and I felt good and it was okay. And so but how did we get to this point where in time, including children in, in the adult worship service, seems like a radical idea? Well, back in the 1960s and 70s, the, uh, the baby boomers, boomers generation rebelled against church, among many other things that they rebelled against. And roughly two-thirds of that generation dropped out of the church. By, by the 1980s, some well-intended pastors started looking for ways to get the boomer generation back, though. One thing they did was to become a seeker-friendly church, meaning they just, they're doing what they can to get people outside into the church, into the seats. And they wanted to provide adults uh, with a time of just uninterrupted, uninterrupted time to just sit quietly and, without any distraction and, and listen to a sermon. Uh, I mean, who doesn't like uninterrupted time anyway, right? But and in order to provide that uninterrupted time, those churches had to create classes for kids to go to in order for uh, there to be a way for the parents to be in there. But this, this right here caused one huge unintended consequence. We have raised the largest unchurched generation in the history of our country. And our well-intended efforts to reach children at their level have, have we, as a church, the church in the United States, have we unwittingly hindered our little ones from coming to Christ? We, we say it often that the word matters here because the Bible is God's word for us and it's important. So then we need to try to answer this question of why should children gather with us from the scriptures? So what does the Bible say about multi-generational worship? First off, multi-generational worship. Multi meaning many. Uh, the word generational refers to the concept of generation, and a generation, um, especially in a biblical sense, is basically the time span between parents and kids. So kids, if you want to think about it this way, your, your grandparents are one generation, your parents are another, and you and your friends are another generation. Simply put, multi-generational worship is multiple generations gathering together to worship, from the youngest to the oldest. Now that we know what that's like, uh, let's open up our Bibles to Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9. If you need a Bible, we have some up here on the front quarters as well in, as the back uh, tables. Just make sure if you can't read Spanish, don't, don't grab the Spanish Bibles. It's not going to help you much uh, because we do have those up here too. But if you can, that is your gift for you. So hopefully some of y'all have already read these verses last night. If, if you have our church app... You should have gotten a message yesterday about one of the passages that we are going to look at today. Uh, that way you can sit down, maybe in your quiet time, maybe as uh, a family in your family worship time, and just prepare your heart for today. Because Sunday morning is a Saturday decision. So we're going to look at Deuteronomy 6. Uh, if you can please stand. Um, and at the reading of God's word, let's look at these verses. Um, if you got it. You know the thing? All right. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. 
Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. <clears throat> Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as your frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Father, this is your word for us today. Lord, may we cherish it. May you help us as a church to lift our eyes to see you more clearly today. Lord, speak to us. Uh, lay me aside, Lord, that you may be seen, you may be glorified again this morning. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys may be seated. So we know it starts in the home, but it doesn't stop there. Since this is God's design, it, it shouldn't surprise us to see the foundation of this practice from the very beginning. So, so why should children gather with us today is the same reason they did back then, to observe and experience the highs and lows of walking with God. Let's look at a, a couple other verses. You don't have to stand for these. We're going to look at a couple other verses uh, that we see this same thing happening in. Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 13 says, And Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn the fear of the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land that you are going over to the Jordan to possess. Kids are there, and, and they observe, and they experience God's faithfulness to be with them. Here's another passage from Joshua 34, uh, 8, 34 through 35, where Joshua is reading from the book of the law after the fall of Ai. And it says, And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. Here, the kids are there and they observe and they experience Joshua's reading God's word as they gather together in celebration of the Lord's faithfulness to his people. There's a certain situation in, in 2 Chronicles uh, where Jehoshaphat and the, and the people of Judah were fearful of the hostile army that was coming to destroy the people of Israel. So Jehosh Jehoshaphat gathered all the people of Judah. He gathered them together and he prays the following prayer. Behold, they reward us by coming up to drive us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. O oh God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great whore that is coming against us. We did not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And what exactly did the people of Judah do with their kids during this? Well, 13 says, Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, their children. Kids are there. And they observe and they experience God's calling of God's protection from their enemies. A few years ago, um, Pastor AJ, uh, he preached through the book of Nehemiah. And, and Nehemiah and his people, they had gathered together and they were rebuilding the broken down walls in Jerusalem. Uh, and when the wall was complete, the people were celebrating the, the, the Feast of Booths as they gathered for corporate worship. It says in Nehemiah 8, 1 through 3, and all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And, and they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. 
So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and all those who could understand, and the ears of all of people were attentive to the book of the law. This is multiple generations gathering together and listening to the book of the law being read. The kids are there, and they experience and they, they observe the celebration of the Feast of Booze. Kids, I got a question for you. This is going to be interactive, so I need you guys to answer loudly if you know this. Does anybody know who wrote the book of Proverbs? Anybody? Solomon and some other people. That's right. Through the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We're to teach them to model our lives before the younger generations, to show them so that the Lord willing, one day they would walk with him. So we ask, why should children gather with us? And the answer that I propose to you today is the big idea for today, that since the beginning, God's design is for families to gather together for corporate worship. Kids, you can write that, that big idea down in your, your sermon notes. So I'll say it again. God's design is for families to gather together for corporate worship. We've seen the kids gather corporately and worship with their families in the Old Testament, but then we see Jesus come in the New Testament. God's design remains from the Old Testament to the new. Kids, how many of y'all have heard the story about Jesus feeding 5,000 people with fish and bread? Hands up. All right, quite a few of the kids in the room have heard this, right? So Matthew chapter 14, verse 21 says, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So, so from reading this, the children were present as Jesus was speaking to the people. You see, the kids are there, and they, uh, they observe, and they experience Jesus performing miracles. In Matthew 19, 13 through 15, Jesus welcomed the children. It says, then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them. This is, this is Jesus. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, and he went away. The kids, again, they are there, and they observe, and they experience Jesus welcoming them to come to him. Jesus here is saying to you, kids, he's, this is what he's saying to you, you are very important to him. Okay, so we see Jesus is walking and talking to the people, and the kids are present, but this is all before the church started, right? So then, how has the church historically practiced multi-generational worship? So let's look at the history of how this all played out in the church. Kids, question again for you. Do any of you know what book we look to to see the start of the church? Anybody? Acts. Yeah. We look at the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, we can read and see how the church started. The book of Acts also tells the story of lots of different churches, one of them being the church at Ephesus. So who, kids, adults too if you want to, but uh, has heard of the Apostle Paul? Lots of hands going up, right? All right. Do you all know how many books that Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament? Anybody? Any guesses? Keep coming. Anybody else? Not one. Not one. Kids, anybody else? Adults, you want to help them? 20. How many books? 20. At least 13 that we know of. Well, one of the books that Paul wrote was the book of Ephesians. He was writing to the church in Ephesus. A, a few of us have actually been there when we went to Turkey. This letter to the Ephesians was intended to be read with all the assembly of the church gathered together. In Ephesians 6, 
Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Now, why would Paul address the kids in the letter to Ephesians? If he was addressing them in this letter, then where would the kids have to be? Right there, gathered with the rest of the church in the worship service. Paul knew God's design is for families to gather together for corporate worship. Maybe we start to think, oh, well, maybe Paul thought he'd, he'd say this for the kids that just happened to be there with their parents. But again, Paul addresses the same thing in Colossians 3, verse 20, where he says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. This continues to show that there is strong evidence that the children gathering with the other generations to worship was a biblical norm. And the children gathering has been the historical norm for the first 1,700 years of the church. Kids, raise your hand if you've heard of Martin Luther. All right, good. Martin Luther, he was a pastor and he was a theologian in the, 19, or the, in the 1500s. And he said, when I preach, I sink myself deep down. I regard neither doctors nor magistrates of whom are here in this church above 40, but I have an eye to the multitude of young people and the children of among whom are more than 2,000. I preach to those directing myself to them that have need. Matthew Henry, another theologian speaking on, on 1 Samuel 1, 19 through 28, said, little children should learn to worship. Their parents should instruct them in worship and bring them to it, put them upon engaging in it as well as they can, and God graciously will accept them and teach them to do better. So, so if there's so many examples from the scriptures throughout history that encourage children to gather together in corporate worship, why is it that there's Sunday school? I mean, given that we just started that a couple weeks ago as a church. Does anybody know how Sunday school started? Thank you, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> anybody else? <laughs> I mean, that dude's been more faithful longer than I've been alive. Kids, could you imagine working 12 hours a day at age five or six? Could you imagine that? Okay, let me try that. Adults, could you imagine working 12 hours a day? Yes. Yeah, some of you can, because some of you do it. Uh, well, in the 1700s, there were many kids that were working 12 hours a day, six days a week, to help provide for their family with only having Sundays off to work. Can you imagine that? And on their days off, kids were doing what kids do. They just run loose on the streets. I could see John doing that. Yeah. They were going to school, or sorry, they weren't going to school. They weren't learning to read. Some of y'all's kids, uh, y'all think that sounds fun, don't you? Not going to school, not having to do these things, not learning to read. But would you rather go to school or work 12 hours a day, six days a week? Yeah, so y'all better stop complaining then. Going to school is cool, stick with it. All right. In the early 1700s, Sunday school was started in hopes to raise the literacy and the morality of children in England, which unintentionally shifted the weight for, of the responsibility from the parents to the church. Sounds a bit familiar in our culture today, where a lot of times we can hope the church teaches them because we ain't doing it at home. It's not the job of the church to teach your children about the Lord. It's the parent's job. The church's job, though, is to supplement, to support you, to pray for you, and to walk with you in this. Then in 1790, the first American Sunday school opened its doors in Philadelphia, known as First Day Society, where they taught reading, writing, and the formation of moral consciousness. Not long after this came the age-specific classes of Sunday school. You, you remember uh, earlier on uh, me talking about the boomers generation? And you know, uh, the ones who had dropped out of the church at an alarming rate? By the time all of this, the age-segregated the age segregated mindset came around, it was in full swing in the church for these boomers. All of that was happening during the worship gathering, 
And so the, these boomers are expecting their kids to sit in the quote-unquote adult church service was just making less and less sense to them. For years, the church has tried to understand this problem of why do the youth and, and, and the young adults, why do they, this generation, why do they leave the church? For, for many years, those kids from a young age were separated from a corp, corporate worship gathering. But if we segregate our kids out of worship, we may never assimilate them back into the life of the congregation. In fact, there was a study done a, a while back that determined that, that children who, who attended Sunday school but did not attend church service are more likely not to attend church as adults. However, children that attended church service but not Sunday school are more likely to attend church as adults. But that was them, and then this is here and now for us. What does multi-generational worship look like for us? We have the tendency to think the service is just over their heads. It's supposed to be over their heads. They're beginners in this. It'd be like us. The English language is over their heads when they come out of the womb, but we don't just take these little babies and stick them with other little babies and say, well, let's put them babies together and let's just hope and make the best of it. No, we start talking to them early on. They don't know what we're saying. They eventually get the no's, the ones we don't want them to know, right? And then they hear these little words and they start to do what we do and say what we say. Kids are smart and they can understand the other day, I, I asked what my seven-year-old uh, was learning in school, and, and here's, here's what I was told. Classification of living things, parts of animal and plant cells, the Ten Commandments, Greek and Roman gods, seven wonders of the ancient world, ancient world geography, Latin noun cases, and first declension noun endings, and what the definition of preposition is. He's seven. I'm 42. I couldn't tell you half of what he was talking about. But that's what he's learning. At seven, you, you see, they're smart and they can learn so much. And because God knows that kids are smart and they can understand, his design was for them to gather with God's people. God isn't hindered when children gather with us. The reality is that there's a spiritual benefit for children who, who participate in the corporate worship gathering. Children have come to faith sitting in worship services the Holy Spirit is not hindered. He can convict them. I don't believe that children who have been in children's church for several years will be more inclined, or better trained for that matter, to enjoy the worship if they had spent those years beside their parents. In fact, it will probably be harder to acclimate 10 to 12-year-olds to a new worship service than a 5 to 6-year-old. At a young age, sure, they wiggle, they make some noises, right? Uh, but they are able to be taught much easier to engage early on, allowing them to progress over time. We don't, we don't have to look far to see our culture that tells us that kids, they just get in the way of a good life. And we can fall into this trap thinking that we don't need to lead our kids in certain ways. But why do we think it's a good thing to listen to what our culture says to do anyway? Why do we think that we can consume for our lives but not contribute to the spiritual well-being of our kids or our grandkids or our friends' kids? Look at it, invest, look at it as investing money. You take some money, you invest it early in life, you watch it, you keep an eye on it, and you continue that faithfully over the years, and you have a bigger return at the end versus going the whole life, not putting in, not investing anything, and then you get to 60 and go, hey, I'm trying to dump a whole bunch of money right here or a little bit of money and hope it just grows quickly. It doesn't work like that. We have to invest in them now, and sometimes it's just as simple as asking questions. A few weeks ago, AJ asked the question, if you died today, would you go to heaven or hell? That strikes a chord in the hearts of not just adults, but in children as well. 
That question doesn't just make the heart of an adult tremble. That can make anyone tremble. From the youngest to the oldest, since God has created every one of us, he has created us to worship. And not just anything or anyone, he created us to worship him. But since the foundation of the world, when God created everything, we have sinned against our holy God. Since Adam and Eve's eating of that forbidden fruit, we have rebelled and we have worshiped creation rather than the creator. We have never been able to worship God with our whole heart like Deuteronomy calls us to. And because of that, we have separated ourselves from our holy God for all eternity, unable to pay for our own sins, unless, unless God, God saw fit to send his only son to walk on this earth the way that you and I should have, sinlessly. And we collectively have not done that. Then, if, if God saw fit to send him, Jesus, there would be a way for our sins to be paid for. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus came. He lived perfectly. And because of the love of the Father and for him and desire to make our relationship right with God, Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty of our sins for all who would call on the name of Jesus to be saved. Jesus saved me, and he saved many of you, many of you who have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ for salvation. Jesus changed our hearts fully and forever. Amen? Amen. But many in this room today, you are still living the way that you want to in rebellion to our holy God. And the Bible says that unless you turn from your sins, the wrath of God is upon you. You see, God saves you out of his love for you, not out of an anger against you. God's love is something my words up here or any other human words can never be able to express the beauty of. We can treasure our Lord Jesus. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have to be a certain age for Jesus to save you. Jesus saves. He can save grandmas, grandpas, moms, dads, singles, youth, youth, and yes, he can save children. And we want children to grow up with the sense of all treasuring Jesus. John Piper, speaking on children, said, there's a sense of all which children should experience in the presence of God. This is, this is not likely to happen in, in children's church. Is there a such thing as children's thunder or children's lightning? No. Then why would we segregate our children from the, from the beauty and magnificence of worshiping our holy God corporately? They can sing with us, learn with us, pray with us, and they can gather with us. Children hear more than we think, and they learn and do more than what we realize. They're like little sponges. What do sponges do? Anybody, kids, what do sponges do? They soak up everything around them. That's right. It absorbs it all in. Y'all ever heard the expression, do as I say, not as I do? Does it work? Uh, let's try it again. Does it work? No. no. Like many adults, children do what they see. They, they learn and they absorb a crazy amount of information. Sure. Some of the sermon may go over their heads, but none of us retains all of it. Y'all ever seen the TV show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? It, raise your hand if you've seen that TV show. Okay, so a lot of us have seen this. So they made an old one back in the, like, I don't know, 60s, 70s, something like that. They had another one in the 90s, 2000s, right? Man, I'd be really afraid to go on that show as an adult uh, because those kids are demolishing the adults, and it is... It's just straight embarrassing, honestly. I couldn't do it. Uh, I really thought about trying that with y'all today. Uh, just, just random adults up here and then random kids and just see what happens. But I, I just I couldn't do it. Um, kids that grow up regularly attending the corporate worship service, unless we teach them otherwise, will likely grow up thinking, this is where I belong on a Sunday morning. Now let me push pause for a second. If I'm not careful it could really sound like I'm not in favor of Sunday school. And you're probably thinking, uh, didn't, didn't we just start this? Yes, 
we just started Sunday school at 9 o'clock, and, and I believe that Sunday school is a great thing. I learned a ton when I was growing up in Sunday school, as did many of you probably. Let me just say, shout out again. We've got some incredible teachers back there in Cam Kids. Amen? All right. We, we can clap loud. Come on. All right. Incredible teachers back there. There's a difference in Sunday school and what's often called children's church. Sunday school is meant to be a time before or after the corporate worship service. Children's church was created, especially in that, that boomer's age, in the, the 80s, to, to create classes during the, cor cor during the corporate worship gathering in order to let parents just worship without interruption. What I'm saying is that we have to be extremely careful and think that we could or should replace the corporate worship gathering with children's classes. Sunday school classes are helpful to all of us, but for any of us, from the youngest to the oldest, our primary place of gathering together is the corporate worship gathering. And because God's design is for families to gather together for corporate worship, every member here has a unique role that we are all, every single one of us, all of us invited into. But we, we have to have realistic expectations, right? <clears throat> Are we expecting our kids to come in service and, and uh, just behave, not move, not wiggle? Are we? I mean, we, we might internally be thinking, don't move, don't talk, be quiet, sit still. Like, yes, I get that. Well, a few weeks ago, Robert Snow engaged us in a teaching on a class about how we as a church can prepare our kids and parents as well to gather in the corporate worship gathering with us. Still on? This is fun. Uh, at least you guys are awake and did not off on me. Um, so in the chair back in front of you, do you guys see paper? Hold it up. All right, so lots of us have it. Um, there's a sheet that he created with some really helpful information, especially for you parents, but don't just, don't just like leave it as parents. Uh, for us to, to engage kids in the corporate worship together, so take it home, read it, apply these things to your life and the life of your family. This information has been really helpful for me. Uh, it was great for him to teach many of us. He did an incredible job. Honestly, I just thought, hey, I'm going to ask Robert to come up here and preach for me this morning. Um, <clears throat> no? All right. Robert's like, no way. Um, here, Robert taught on these things. Sunday service starts on Saturday. We can prepare by preparing kids on Saturday, reading Sunday passages together, laying out clothes on a Saturday, getting a good night's sleep. We can prepare by having realistic expectations. Don't just expect a child to come in and be able to get, uh, or get up and be able to get dressed on themselves, come to church, not wiggle, not talk, not ask questions. Discipline and structure do make it easier, though, for them. We can do that, and we can help them with that. Kids, just like adults, like we move, we wiggle. It can be hard to sit still, right? But a, a few weeks, ago, or uh, but with a few weeks, or even a few months of struggling with a four or five year old, teaching them to sit in corporate worship setting, it yields benefits for the rest of their lives. Though it may be a little distracting at times, teaching a kid to sit still and be quiet is one of the tasks that just as a as a parent, as adults, we have to teach kids because they need to learn this. If, if they're expected to go to school and sit for a couple hours and not move or not talk, why don't we do, why don't we expect the same thing at church sometimes? Listen, learn, engage. Uh, because let's face it, church is more important than school anyways. There, I said it. But it's true. Do they make noise sometimes? Do they ask questions? Absolutely they do. We can help them understand they're welcome to ask questions about the service. But some other questions, you got to wait till later, buddy. We can talk about that later. We must admit that while, while the parents of a child have the responsibility to, uh, and love to mitigate their distractions, the listeners around them, they also have the responsibility to listen and focus. Many people can watch a sports game or just be zoned in on our phones uh, without even hearing a voice of the person next to them. I did this just the other day when I'm just zoned in on my phone. I'm reading an article, and E-Man is right next to me, and he's asking questions. And Rachel's like, Jamie, are you listening to him? I'm like, what? We just get zoned in sometimes. We can do that. We can focus. 
For us to be overly distracted by wiggling or noises while listening to God's word tells us more about ourselves than about the children around us who are still learning appropriate behaviors. Every squirm and peep is a reminder to us that they are God's gift. We can prepare by giving instruction, explaining our expectations to them, telling them what's going to happen in the service, having them use the bathroom before it starts. We can teach them to sit quietly and listen. Yes, we need to love each other, not be overly distracted. Parents should, should take into consider the, consideration these things. Maybe for a time we have to remove the kid, go out, talk to him for a second, bring him right back in. Listen, if we give the old stink eye to somebody who's taking their kid out and bringing them back in, is that really how we help others? No. We can prepare by being a good model for them. The greatest stumbling block to children in worship is parents and other church members who do not cherish their own worship. They do not love it. Children can feel the difference between duty and delight. They know whether mom or dad or whoever loves being here or not. For those who aren't parents or maybe are empty, nest, empty nesters, God has placed you to help parents now. So, empty nesters, do you remember the difficulties when your kids were little? What did you need to hear then that you could say to a, a parent of a young child now? Maybe you can lean in. You can ask the, if you could just help. But that takes you knowing some names of, of the people around you in order to do that. These kids here are a blessing. And there's no place they need to be on a Sunday morning than standing with mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or a faithful friend that models them the beauty and magnificence of Christ. When children gather with us, they observe and experience the highs and the lows of our faith family. From the sending of short-term mission teams to watching people go through the waters of baptism to the prayers for the Lord to provide a kidney for Laura and how he has answered those prayers through Chrissy. And because the children are here with us today, they're able to observe and experience one way that we remember what the Lord has done with us, for us, through communion. So today, we are going to take communion together. The Lord, with his disciples, he was with them on the night that he was betrayed to go to the cross. And that is what we're remembering today, that Christ has gone to the cross on our behalf to pay for our sins, and because he went to the cross and rose again three days later, those who call on the name of Jesus can have salvation. But there's nothing special about this juice. There's nothing special about this bread. If you're not a Christian here today, you don't need to come up and take communion you need to call upon the name of the Lord this morning. That's who you need. These tables are going to be open for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ to go to the tables, to eat the bread, to drink the juice, and to remember what the Lord has done. So for those of you who uh, are going to help with communion this morning, would you guys come forward? And for those of you who are sitting in the pews, take, take a couple seconds. Pray, thank the Lord, remember what he has done. Talk to your kids about what's happening right now. Come up, and we're, we're going to take communion together as a church, not, not just separately. So when you do come up, grab a cup, grab a wafer, go back to your seat, and when I see that everybody has been seated, I'll give some further instructions.
So I'm going to be reading. But first, let me ask the question. Do you ever just, during communion, just watch people go towards communion tables and just thank God for all the people able to walk towards those tables on behalf of what Jesus has done? Do you ever just set in all of that? Next time we do communion, I'd, I'd really encourage that. That's probably one of my highlights here. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 11, starting verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this, is, this cup is the covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, we have a lot to be thankful for. And as the band comes, kids, I just want to invite you. If you didn't sing or you haven't sung with the people standing next to you before, and you can read what's on the screen, I'd really encourage you to just start trying to do that this morning. And if you can't read, just listen. Watch the mommies and daddies and parents and people around you. Just watch them sing this morning these next two songs. So church, turn it over to Garrett.